Hello, and thank you so much for joining me, Lead MN, and the Today's Students Coalition for a training on leadership and storytelling with a special focus on the public narrative framework. My name is Erin Finucane, and I'm the founder of Old City Strategies, a boutique social change agency that empowers nonprofits, brands, and advocacy groups to fight for the world as it should be. I'm delighted to be here with you for this two-part training series. Some quick housekeeping. In part one, which we'll dive into today, we'll discuss storytelling as a leadership practice, why stories are important, and introduce the public narrative framework. In part two, we'll discuss storytelling and advocacy and specifically prepare your public narrative ahead of your lobby day. You should have access to a worksheet that'll help you as you're diving into the craft. If you have questions at any point, you can reach out to me at erin at oldcitystrategies.com. Let's jump in. So where does the public narrative framework come from? Well, it's an approach developed by this gentleman here, Marshall Gans, a researcher at Harvard. Marshall cut his teeth as an organizer in the civil rights and labor movements of the 60s and 70s before going on to become an academic later in life. And this framework has been utilized by some of the most effective campaigns and movements around the world, and in my view, is essential to creating change. I used it for more than a decade in my career as an organizer and movement builder, and also had an opportunity to do a deep dive into public narrative at the Kennedy School with Marshall. So our training today will be based on Marshall's work and my own experience using public narrative while leading campaigns around the world. So why are stories important? We're all coming to this discussion as advocates. And the, one of the greatest challenges and for any advocate is how do you break through? How do you overcome the inertia of habit and the status quo to create urgency? Sometimes it comes from urgency of need, other times urgency of opportunity. Sometimes it comes from outrage, a disconnect between the world as it is and the world as it should be. Stories help us communicate that tension because they communicate our values and they answer the question of why. Why does it matter? Why do we care? And not just why we ought to act, but why we must. Emotions are key to motivation and as advocates, motivation is the business we're in. So it's important to understand the emotions that inhibit action and those that facilitate action. Urgency overcomes inertia. Urgency captures our attention and creates space for new priorities. Anger or outrage overcomes apathy. We've seen this a lot in the last few years as protests and demonstrations condemning police brutality have been dramatically on the rise. And that's that tension we talked about, the world as it is versus the world as it should be. Hope overcomes fear. A 15th century scholar named Moses Maimonides is responsible for my favorite definition of hope. Hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. It's always probable that Goliath will win, but sometimes David does. Solidarity overcomes isolation. This is why we have mass meetings and movement specific rituals and language like, yes, we can. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You can make a difference overcomes self doubt. We want to focus on what people can achieve and not what they can't. Storytelling is a practice of leadership. And so for the purposes of this training, leadership is defined as accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Public narrative is a leadership practice of translating values into action. Crafting a complete public narrative is a way of, to connect three core elements of leadership practice. Story, why we must act now, the heart. Strategy, how we can act now, the head, and action, what we must do now, the hands. Rabbi Hillel, a first century sage, posed three questions that are foundational to leadership and this framework. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? What am I called to do? What is my community called to do? And what are we all called to do now? These are the questions we'll be answering as we craft our narratives in this training. All stories have three elements, a plot, a character, and a moral. Strong narratives revolve around moments, often a moment when things change. The plot, 
what happens in the movement has three component parts, challenge, choice, and outcome. It engages us and makes us pay attention because there's uncertainty or the unexpected, both of which are central to the human experience. So we pay attention. The plot only works though if we can identify with the character at the center of it. Think about a book that you read or a movie you watched where you just couldn't identify with any of the characters. You probably lost interest pretty quickly, maybe started scrolling on your phone, but other times when a character reminded you of you or when a character was a friend or family member, you may have identified with them quite a bit and had a very different, more moving experience as a result. The moral is a teaching to the heart. It's experiential. The story of David and Goliath isn't an instruction on how to slay giants. It teaches us that the underdog with hope, resourcefulness, and creativity can defeat the big dog. We feel David's fear and we feel his courage and it gives us hope that when we encounter our Goliaths in our own lives, that we can prevail as well. This is all stuff that organizers and storytellers have known for ages and science is finally catching up. When we hear a story, it actually alters our neurochemical process. The brain activity of both the storyteller and the listener begins to align thanks to mirror neurons. And these brain cells begin to fire not only when something happens to us, but when something happens to someone else. We're able to not just hear about an experience, but we feel it. The story becomes real in our brains and in our bodies. Adrenaline pumps to release cortisol when the characters experience stress. Oxytocin is released when characters experience human connection, as if we're experiencing the connection as well. And at that point, we are on the empathy train and there is no turning back. The listener is hooked and primed to take action. And this is critical to public leadership, which utilizes both the head and the heart, as we talked about, to mobilize others effectively, because it engages people in interpreting why they should change the world, their motivation, and then how they can change the world through strategy. The public narrative is the why, the art of translating values into action through stories. Specifically, public narrative combines the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. A story of self communicates the values that calls you to the need in this moment, in this way, in this place, and in this time. A story of us communicates shared values that anchor your community, values that may be at risk or values that may be sources of hope. And just as with the story of self, the values of a community are often expressed through key choice points, founding moments of a movement or moments of crisis, of triumph, of disaster, and stories of us are accounts of events involving specific people and moments and events and words. A story of now communicates an urgent challenge. You're calling on your community to join you and act on. So we're gonna look at an example by James Croft, a former student at Harvard. A quick warning here that he does mention suicide and uses some harsh language and pretty disturbing imagery. So please take care of yourself and proceed with caution. teachers, a PE teacher, 
used to make fun of me. He used to say how girly I was, how dancing is not something the boy should do. I remember the sneer on his face as I walked past, and I remember he was the first person to call me a fag, which at seven years old, I didn't really understand. I remember in high school how gay was only ever used as a term of abuse. And I remember one cold morning sitting in assembly while the principal intoned, homosexuals deserve our pity and our prayers. And I sat among hundreds of other boys thinking I was all alone in the world, that I was the only one who had this problem. Now, not everyone may have experienced something like that, but we all know, I think, what it means to feel alone, to feel like there's no one on our side. Perhaps you were too tall and the short kids made fun of you. Or perhaps you were too short and you got it from the taller ones. Or perhaps you were too smart or too dumb or from the wrong side of town or the wrong race. We all know, I think, even if just for a moment, what it feels like to think that there's no one on your side, that no one has your back. And all of us, if there are young people in our lives that we care about, can agree that we don't want this to happen to them. Imagine, if you can, what it must be like to come home and see a strange shape hanging from a tree in your backyard, twisting in the wind, the creak of the branch as it bends beneath the weight, and that feeling in your gut as you get closer and you realize what it is hanging there, who it is, who it was, because that was Seth Walsh, 13, who hung himself from a tree in his backyard. It was Billy Lucas who hung himself at his grandmother's house. And it was Raymond Chase who hung himself in his door. And it could have been your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or your friend. It could have been one of us. So I know, I, I only came out in March this year. After 10 years, 10 years after I first told my parents that I thought I was gay. And in those 10 years, I lost a lot of opportunities to make a difference. I was a high school teacher, and every day I wasn't out was a day I deprived the gay student of a positive role model. And I'm not willing to waste any more time. I have to act now. We have to act now. And not to let these things happen and then more them afterwards. We need these kids before they jump. And there is something we can do to help as a start. Journalist Dan Savage has started a campaign, the Internet a campaign to send messages of hope to teenagers for being bullied because they're gay or for whatever reason, that they should have hope for their future, that they do have something to live for. And I think that if we made such a video as Harvard students with glittering careers ahead of us and sparkling degrees, then we could make a difference. So we need people to hold a camera, to share their stories, to do editing and sound, to stand in a big group and say it gets better. No contribution is too small. And if you want to get involved and you're an undergraduate, talk to Tevin here if I'm waving. Oh, oh. And he'll tell you how to get involved. And if you're a graduate student or if you just want to come along from 5 to 7 p.m. in the end, live on Rob in Longfellow Hall on the Education Schools campus, stand up and say, we're standing with these kids. We've got your back. Let's catch them before they jump. Thank you. So notice where James begins. He actually begins with the story of now. And he doesn't start with a statistic about suicide among gay youth. He starts with a rather horrifying image of a young man jumping from a bridge. And that's the power of story. Those images bring us right to that moment immediately. And then the next moment, he takes us to his childhood. Now we're in the story of self, squeezing into a leotard as a ballet dancer and all the joy that dancing brought him. The next moment, still in the story of self, being bullied by his PE teacher at seven years old, the first time someone called him that horrible word. And then the next moment in high school when he's older in the auditorium when the principal says homosexuals deserve our pity and then he makes a very deliberate shift to a story of us referencing that we all know what it's like to feel alone he's creating an us through a shared feeling and experience of being isolated and to feel like no one is on our side 
And of course, knowing how painful that is, we want the world to be different today for young people. And then he confronts us with another now moment. And again, he's not sharing data. He's sharing the names of human beings. He's creating an image of bodies hanging in trees. And then he makes a really interesting to choice to share a leadership failure. You know, every day I wasn't out, I deprived a student of a gay role model. And in his vulnerability, we see his strength. We see his leadership and we feel hope. And he calls on us then specifically to catch these kids before they jump, building on the visuals that he used earlier in the story. Then he takes us to the now by offering a path forward through the It Gets Better campaign and tells us that we can choose to do. It's tailored to the people he's speaking to, Harvard students with sparkling degrees. And it ends with a very specific ask, this time, this place. You know, overall, this is an incredibly moving narrative and you can't listen to that and not be moved to action. So now that you've had an opportunity to digest an example, scoot on over to the second part of our training where you'll have an opportunity to, to begin to craft your own public narrative. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at erin at oldcitystrategies.com. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon.